are very difficult for urban local bodies in India to do because of institutional weaknesses and capacity problems that were, that were already uh, discussed this morning. So what she proposes, and I think it's a really um, interesting idea for uh, reasons that I'll, that I'll return to, is to set up a set of indicators which would allow one to measure the things that urban local bodies need to be able to do in order to be considered credit worthy in a sustainable way. So it, it goes beyond the simple notion of credit worthiness and the other kinds of, uh, to, to incorporate the other kinds of, of reforms that, that need to be uh, put, put into place. Uh, the, the chapter by uh, Arnan Sas Raman and, and Vi, uh, Vikram Kapoor um, move into the, the uh, discussion of the role of the private sector in doing, uh, doing the infrastructure services that are needed in, in Indian urban local bodies. And they do a really nice review of some of the challenges uh, in, with, in the Indian system that have, uh, uh, for example, the way that, that finance has been uh, uh, set up and, and the way that it has evolved to a point where now India is using very state of the art from a global perspective initiatives to use bonds and, uh, and credit pooling mechanisms in order to be able to, to finance some um, urban infrastructure. And they also review the experiences with public private partnerships in a way that draws lessons for how these public private partnerships might be structured uh, differently and more effectively in, in the future. And then finally, um, the, there's a chapter by Govinda Rao and Richard Byrd, I, I guess neither of whom um, are, are here today, that tries to, I think, pull together the various elements uh, that are incorporated in the earlier papers plus brings in some of the discussions of transfers and other factors which are really important in the urban fiscal landscape. Uh, so I would uh, really recommend uh, that, uh, that people take, take a look at this. And in all of the chapters, I think, there is an attempt, perhaps not as explicit as needs to be done in the future, but to link these financing mechanisms back to the planning and, and urban mechanisms uh, that, that were uh, treated in the, in the earlier chapters. Now, one thing I will say, uh, and this is the, the takeoff point for the, for the rest of what I'm going to talk about, the, the fiscal federalism literature, the theory for how finances should be structured in intergovernmental environments uh, is fairly simplified. And while it provides clear advice, it also throws up a bunch of challenges. And I, I'm going to read a very short quote from the Rao and Bird paper. None of the tasks assigned to policymakers by the fiscal federalism literature is easy. And few, if any of them, are facilitated by India's current structure of urban governance and finance. Okay, so where do they leave us? They leave us with the point that despite this, the growing importance of urban areas, the need for urban areas to be able to provide an environment that improves the quality of life and supports economic growth is so powerful that India is gonna figure out a way to deal with these things. So, uh, what, when I read these papers and thought about it, it made me start to think about my own experience working on intergovernmental fiscal relations. And I've worked now for nearly 30 years on this in at least 25 countries. So I have seen a lot of different countries and you know, they're, all, um, they're all rather different. But one of the things that really strikes me is that this theory on which we rely, fiscal federalism, which has been so influential 
in the era of decentralization that has taken hold across the world for the last 20 or 30 years has in many respects been a flop. At the very best, it has not brought about the, the, the objectives that it's supposed to bring, uh, bring about. And I think that the, 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 this is particularly troubling because so many countries jump into the decentralization game with a strong will to reform, or at least they say so. And the model is elegant in its ability to point us in certain policy directions. So why are these policy directions and the objectives that they're targeted to not being achieved? And I think the answer to those questions, uh, we already heard a lot of them in, in some of the, the, the discussion this morning. So um, I, I think that we know some of the things that are, that are a challenge. Uh, there, there's uh, there's trade-offs among principles. There's fragmentation of, of institutions we, we saw this morning. Uh, there's economic realities that, that uh, limit uh, revenue generation. There's lack of good information. There's capacity constraints, uh, so, so on and so forth. And um, I think that the, uh, there's also been a recognition by the people who do this kind of work that one needs to look beyond the basic uh, fiscal federalism principles and also look at the larger set of institutional structures that, that need to be in place. But the bottom line for me is that fiscal decentralization and governance design remains dominated by this fairly normative, narrow, technical analytical framework that has a lot of assumptions underlying it, which simply aren't met in the, in the, in the real world. Um, I think that we have had limited analysis of why things haven't worked. Again, we fall back on, there's not enough capacity, let's build capacity. There's not political will, uh, whatever that means, et cetera, et, et, et cetera. So um, I, I think that um, one of the things that needs to be done in any country that wants to understand how to move forward and build on this productive way of thinking about the world, but productive but incomplete way, is to understand what is happening, what's not happening, and, and why in particular places, and, and to learn from that. Because decentralization is not alone in the, in, it, in its it, it failure to achieve some of the goals that it, that it was supposed to achieve. We see public financial management reform, civil service reform, and, and so forth that, that, that haven't um, been able to uh, achieve their, their goals. But I guess then the question is, what is it that we need to use beyond fiscal federalism in order to make the theories work better for us and, and to think about uh, better, better practice. So I'm gonna quickly talk about uh, five points that I think are, are worth mentioning. Um, one is the, 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 that the theory does not consider. One is the national and intergovernmental political e economy uh, dynamics. As I said, the politics of this are often uh, uh, put down to the, there's not political will. But what does political will mean? The, the problem is that politicians and bureaucrats support stronger local governments when it meets their own interests. And these can be um, electoral interests, they can be security of tenure, they can be career trajectories, they can be many different kinds of things. Sometimes the reasons that, that policies to support stronger local governments are adopted actually have nothing to do with the reasons that fiscal federalism says we should be adopting these policies. 
And I think that we may not be able to do anything about this, but what, but understanding it and what it implies for how reform should be approached, I think is, is something that we need to think more about. The, the second thing is the central government um, bureaucratic environment. And we've discussed this in a case of a, a federal country like India, state governments um, also. Uh, we heard a lot about the siloed uh, approach this morning. And I think the siloed approach is even worse than it was portrayed this morning. This morning we were talking about the siloed approach as one group dealing with transport, one group dealing with land, this sort of thing. But the siloed approach has to do also with the fundamental mechanisms of the state for managing public resources. In many of the countries that, I, that I've worked in, you have situations in which there's uh, uh, one ministry pushing for decentralization and public financial management reform and civil service reforms being carried out by other ministries or other commissions are pulling power away or confusing things. So I think this is a really important thing that, that we need to, um, to, to think about. There's also the issue of how these things work on the ground, the subnational um, political and institutional dynamics um, and, and accountability. One thing we know is that how subnational governments, even if you give them power, use it on the ground, um, is, is going to be uh, conditioned on the distribution and the concentration of local powers. Um, and I think that the, the issue is what are the incentives faced by local bureaucrats and local politicians to do the things that they're supposed to, to, to do. And they're, um, this morning we talked about these silos and recognized that there aren't easy ways of, uh, of getting around the silos. I think we didn't talk so much about these local issues and understanding how some places have been able to perform more effectively even in the context of the problems that have been identified that affect uh, performance. Uh, a related issue as to what goes on at the local level has to do with the urban, with urban area governance. Do you have a unified metropolitan system? Do you have uh, functional fragmentation? Do you have jurisdictional fragmentation? And these things create problems around the, the globe and, and uh, we can talk more about them uh, if, if people want to. But I, I see that, the, that in few countries have been able to take this bull by the horn and deal with getting the various jurisdictions in urban areas to work together um, better. And there's a set of issues at the subnational level around uh, subnational elections. Um, you know, the, the, the fiscal federalism literature almost presumes that if you have national elections, you've got a mechanism for dealing with local people and getting their preferences. And we know that subnational elections are very complicated, that, um, that, the, that the way that they play out depends on a lot of factors, uh, other factors on, on the ground. And we also know that elections are a blunt accountability instrument and that it's really critical to think about the kinds of other accountability mechanisms at the subnational level that uh, we're going to talk about in the next section. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, leave, leave that. But the bottom line about the, this subnational thing is that for local governments to work the way that fiscal federalism presumes there to work, there has to be a social contract between citizens and their local governments. There is increasingly a literature that looks, for example, since we're talking about revenues, at, the, uh, at, at taxpayer compliance.